Modern medicine is incredible. Over the last century, we've eradicated infectious diseases from the planet, we've unlocked the secrets of our genetic code, and are starting to use our individual genetic makeup to guide what medications we're given. We can perform heart surgery on fetuses still in the womb, or perform surgery via robots from thousands of miles away. But despite these amazing advances, modern medicine is not perfect. And one of the most disturbing, yet probably true claims in medicine, is that most published research is actually wrong. This video is going to be divided into three parts. In the first, I'll present a couple pieces of empiric evidence that most published research is wrong. In the second, I'll explain why it's wrong, and I'll end with some ideas about how we can collectively make less of it wrong. The first piece of empiric evidence is something that can be equally appreciated by both lay people and healthcare professionals. Consider how often you've heard on the news or read on the web about some food that either causes or prevents cancer. It seems like everything we eat has some impact on our cancer risk, but if you pay really close attention to these news reports over years, you start to realize that some of them are contradicting one another. To systematically explore this contradiction, in 2012, researchers picked 50 common ingredients from a cookbook and search the literature for evidence of any reported association with cancer. 80% of the ingredients had at least one study reporting such an association. Here's a graphical summary for all ingredients which were investigated in at least 10 studies. Yeah, so apparently almost everything we eat both causes and prevents cancer. Clearly, at the absolute least, half of the studies of food and cancer must necessarily be wrong, and in fact, it's probably quite a bit higher than half because there's no reason to suspect that most food has a real effect one way or another. A second piece of evidence that most published medical research is wrong. A 2003 review that identified 101 articles in major basic science journals, such as Nature and Science, published between 1979 and 1983. Each of these articles discussed a new basic science discovery that claimed to have a future clinical therapeutic or preventative application. These were promising discoveries. Over the subsequent 20 years, of those 101 promising discoveries, just 27 of them resulted in an actual clinical trial, of which five were licensed for clinical use, and only one a class of antihypertensive medication called ACE inhibitors entered into common use. That's a 1% rate of translating exciting discoveries into tangible clinical application. Think about that the next time you hear about the latest fad of medicine being described as amazing, transformative, or game-changing. Why is this conversion rate of promising research so low? Why don't the vast majority of promising discoveries live up to their hype. There are several reasons, including lack of financial incentives. However, much of it has to do with the fact that conclusions from the original basic science research were simply not an accurate description of reality. A set of observations may have generated an interesting hypothesis, but future experiments didn't support it. And the more exciting and paradigm-shifting a discovery seems to be, the less likely it's going to pan out. This is cliche, but if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. The third piece of empiric evidence is something commonly called the reproducibility crisis or replication crisis. This refers to the observation that many scientific experiments with significant positive findings cannot be replicated if repeated. The issue gained widespread attention in 2015 when the journal Science published the results of the reproducibility project an initiative which sought to replicate 100 studies published in three psychology journals from 2008. This was a massive undertaking requiring hundreds of investigators who collaborated with the authors of the original studies in order to recreate the exact same methods and protocols. 
Similar study subjects were exposed to the same conditions and had the same outcomes measured. What did the reproducibility project find? Among the original studies, 97% of them had statistically significant results, usually meaning a p-value less than 0.05. The replication studies, only 36% were statistically significant. Now, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, the p-value of 0.05 as the cutoff for a so-called significant result is completely arbitrary. So the reproducibility project looked further at the size of the measured effects. In summary, the effect sizes measured in the replication studies were about half that in the original studies. And using a combination of statistical analyses, the project determined that less than half of the studied results have been adequately replicated. This doesn't necessarily mean that any one of the contradicted original studies was wrong per se. It's certainly possible that the corresponding replication study was the one reaching the wrong conclusion. And it's also possible that an original and its corresponding replication study were both wrong. But it doesn't actually change the conclusion that we have a lot of difficulty repeating experiments. And if at least half of published research can't be successfully replicated, it suggests that at least half of published research is wrong to begin with. And that brings us to the fourth and last piece of empiric evidence that most medical research is wrong. And this one is the most troubling. It has to do with something called medical reversal. This is the phenomenon in which preliminary but methodologically flawed studies result in the adoption of a medical practice that is found to be ineffective after more robust and reliable research is later performed. In 2011, a group of researchers undertook an examination of the literature to see how frequent medical reversal was. They picked the world's most influential journal of clinical medicine, the New England Journal of Medicine, and reviewed every article published in it between 2001 and 2010, identifying 363 studies that tested the efficacy of an established practice. The results of these studies were categorized as either reaffirmation, in which the practice held up to additional scrutiny, or reversal, when the practice was either no better or was actually worse than older and cheaper alternatives, including no treatment. Of those 363 studies, 38% were categorized as reaffirmation, 40% as reversal, and 22% as inconclusive. Some examples of medical reversal that they encountered included whether or not to give antibiotics to diabetic women with asymptomatic bacteria in the urine, whether coronary stents should be used in addition to optimal medical therapy in patients with stable heart disease, and whether type 2 diabetics should have an aggressive goal for glucose control. You might reasonably ask, if an older study and a newer study contradict one another, why should we assume the newer one is more correct? Well, in these reversals, the newer studies were significantly larger and more methodologically rigorous than the older ones. For example, large, double-blind, randomized controlled trials instead of small observational studies. That does not necessarily mean that the RCT is correct, but well-conducted RCTs are far more likely to be correct than observational studies. A 40% reversal rate is a large number, particularly considering that was higher than the reaffirmation rate. It should make us wonder how many of our current medical practices will eventually be proven to be ineffective. And I think if most of our patients knew how frequent medical reversal was, they would probably think twice about visiting the doctor. For example, if your car was acting up and you took it to the mechanic to be fixed, imagine if the mechanic said, well, I suppose I could change this part here, but there's a 40% chance your car wouldn't work any better, or maybe it would even work worse. Would you pay to have that work done? Probably not. Hopefully, by this point, I've convinced you that there is a major systemic problem with the reliability, accuracy, and reproducibility of medical research. But, but why? For hundreds of years, the scientific method of hypothesis generation, experimental design, observation, analysis, and hypothesis revision, this has been the foundation of our understanding of the world. In physics, 
chemistry, biology, and all the applied sciences, the scientific method is how we know what we know. Why then, when applied to medicine, have the results proven to be so untrustworthy? There are four major factors which contribute to the phenomenon of most published research being wrong. Systematic bias, publication bias, statistically predictable error, and conflicts of interest. First is systematic bias in the design of studies. In this usage, bias doesn't necessarily refer to prejudices by the investigators, but rather refers to aspects of the methodology that erroneously influence the outcome of a trial beyond chance alone. For example, if a clinical trial has selection bias, it means that there were inherent differences in the types of patients who underwent intervention versus control, or inherent differences in the types of patients who did or did not participate in the study at all. If there is a difference in the dropout rate between the intervention and control patients, that results in bias. And when there are systemic differences in the care provided to patients aside from the intervention, such as closer follow-up or additional testing, that would also be a form of bias. Systematic bias can sometimes be a true preventable mistake on the part of investigators, and sometimes it's an unavoidable consequence of the question that's being asked. For example, needing to rely on small sample sizes when studying a rare disease, or being unable to perform a blinded study of a major surgical procedure. And sometimes systematic bias may be introduced intentionally if one is trying to achieve a particular outcome due to a conflict of interest, which I'll be coming back to later on. The second major factor contributing to unreliable research is called publication bias. Publication bias is different than systematic bias in that it occurs after a study has been completed and is not generally under the control of study investigators. Publication bias refers to the well-described phenomenon in which it's easier to publish a positive study than a negative one, where a positive study is considered to be one in which a newer intervention led to a better outcome than its control did. Presumably, because they are believed to be more interesting to readers, medical journals have a strong preference for positive trials. This seems to be particularly true of so-called high-impact journals, which are the small handful of journals that are the most widely cited and more generally, are the most influential. To understand how publication bias works, let's take a hypothetical clinical question. Do perioperative junior mints prevent surgical site infections? Imagine that we have four independent investigators, Jerry, Elaine, George, and Cosmo, who are tackling that question. And let's suppose that each of these four investigators conduct similar sized clinical trials with a similar degree of systematic bias. Due to the probabilistic nature of scientific results, unless a true benefit of junior mints existed and was very dramatic, or the sample sizes used in the trials were extremely large, it's likely that these four trials won't reach the same conclusion. Let's suppose that Jerry, Elaine, and George's trials all found that junior mints did not prevent surgical site infections. That is, they had no influence one way or the other. They were negative trials. And let's suppose Cosmo's trial was a positive one, meaning that it did find that junior mints did prevent infection. All four investigators write papers describing their own trials and results and submit them for publication. But since it's hard to publish negative trials, Jerry and Elaine's papers are never accepted to a journal. George is successful at getting his paper published, but it only makes it into the Journal of the Anti-Infective Properties of Confectionaries. Meanwhile, Cosmo's trial gets published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So now, if you are a typical doctor who likes to keep up with new developments in the medical literature, but only have time for the most influential journals, what are you going to think about junior mints and perioperative infections? You'll probably only come across Cosmo's paper, despite the fact that his was the only one of four trials that found a benefit, and thus you will adopt a medical therapy that is probably ineffective. How often does this happen that publication bias has a tangible impact on standard clinical practice? Consider this 2008 study about publication bias among studies of antidepressants 
investigators looked at 74 FDA-registered clinical trials of 12 different antidepressant medications. These were registrations that are required to be submitted and approved prior to this trial even starting. And because these were FDA-registered trials, it was also mandated to make all results available to the FDA, even if they were never published in a journal. So in other words, all this information is technically available to the public, but it is really challenging to get a hold of it and time-consuming to make sense of it, which is why almost no clinicians bother tracking down the results of the unpublished trials. Of those 74 FDA-registered trials, this is a breakdown of how many were positive or negative and whether or not the results were published in a journal. The results are incredible. Of the 38 positive trials, that is trials which found a benefit of antidepressants compared to placebo, 37 were published and only one was not. While of the 25 negative trials, only three were published and 22 were not. Now, those of you paying close attention may have realized that these numbers don't add up to 74, and that's because 11 trials were deemed by the FDA to either be negative trials or at best questionable, but were nevertheless presented in the literature as positive. So in summary, from the perspective of a person relying solely on the published literature, 48 of 51, or 94% of clinical trials of antidepressants, found them to be beneficial. But from the FDA's perspective, only 38 of 74, or 51% of the trials found them to be beneficial. That's a huge discrepancy. And it's easy to imagine how this adversely impacts a doctor's decision to recommend an antidepressant to their patient. The third major contributor to false published results is often called random error, but I think this is a misleading term for it. I prefer statistically predictable error. The foundation of clinical research is statistics and statistics are inherently probabilistic. If we are studying the effect of a certain drug on a disease, we can never say the drug definitely does or does not have a positive impact. The most we can, or at least should ever say, is the probability that the drug has an impact or the probability that its effect is within a certain range. So naturally, sometimes research will appear wrong, not because someone made a mistake, but rather because a statistically unlikely event happened to have occurred. There are standard cutoffs in clinical research as to how different the outcomes between two groups need to be in order to say that it is unlikely to be due to chance alone. By a large margin, the most common quantification of probability in research is something called the p-value. And a cutoff of a p-value less than 0.05 in clinical medicine is considered to be statistically significant. What the p-value does and doesn't represent is really confusing, and in the interest of time, I'm going to greatly simplify the explanation by just stating that the smaller the p-value, the less likely the results of the study were from chance alone. The cutoff of 0.05 is frequently used to categorize studies Studies of relationships with p-values below 0.05 are called positive, and those above 0.05 are called negative. Implied in this dichotomy is that a positive trial of a new drug suggests the drug works, while a negative trial of a new drug suggests it doesn't work. Unfortunately, there are tons of problems with the application of p-values. First and most obviously, the cutoff of 0.05 is completely arbitrary. If an intervention is studied and found to provide an outcome benefit with a p-value of 0.045, it's not dramatically more believable than if the observed benefit had a p-value of 0.055. Another problem with p-values is that researchers are so focused on them, largely because they know their potential future readers feel most comfortable with them, that they neglect other statistical tests which may actually be more appropriate for their particular question or type of data. However, the most fundamental problem with how clinical medicine uses p-values is that it reduces a continuous distribution of probabilities to a positive 
versus negative dichotomy. This results in physicians uncritically accepting or rejecting trials whose results are much more nuanced. Most physicians are familiar with this relationship. The odds of a disease being present after a test has been performed is equal to the odds of its presence before the test multiplied by the likelihood ratio from the test. In other words, a so-called positive test result doesn't necessarily mean that the person has the corresponding disease because it also depends on how probable the patient was to have the disease to begin with. An analogous relationship exists for interpreting studies. The probability that a statistically significant result demonstrates a true effect is dependent upon not just the statistical strength of the findings, but also upon the probability that the effect was true prior to the study. Or in the words of Carl Sagan, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If we reduce trials to just being positive or negative on the basis of p-values, we lose our ability to apply this reasoning. All this goes back to the probabilistic nature of clinical research. Sometimes when there is no true effect of an intervention, the data will look like there is. And when there is a true effect, sometimes the data will look like there's not. It doesn't necessarily mean that the investigators made a mistake, but it can still lead them and us to the wrong conclusion. And no matter how well designed a study is, statistically predictable error cannot be fully eliminated. The fourth and final contributor to false research findings is conflicts of interest. We like to think that science is always objective and that scientists' one and only goal is the pursuit of truth free from other influences. But unfortunately, that is not reality. Many factors get in the way of that pursuit of objective truth. Some factors are conscious and some are not. Some factors are innocent and some are not. Scientists and clinical researchers are under a lot of pressure. They feel internal pressure from an inherent desire to make new discoveries and grow their reputation. And they feel external pressure from their institutions to publish papers and bring positive publicity and national recognition, all of which will be used as justification for their academic promotions. They also feel external pressure to publish because their success at being awarded grant money to continue their research is largely dependent upon prior success at getting papers out into the world. There's a saying in academia, publish or perish. Research productivity is seen as synonymous with the number of papers published. Unfortunately, because of publication bias, this leads to terrible incentives. Positive trials are more likely to be published than negative ones, and replication trials are rarely published. And the more eye-catching or unexpected the conclusion, the more likely the study will be published, and the, therefore the consequences of how these conflicts of interest and these features of publication bias interact are entirely predictable. First, few researchers perform replication studies, leaving many of our common medical practices to be based on a single study, which might unknowingly claim false conclusions due to various forms of bias and statistically predictable error. Second, researchers are incentivized to preferentially design their studies and data analysis in such a way as to maximize the chance of a positive result. This results in a practice called data dredging with the catchy term p-hacking. One form of p-hacking includes investigating tons of secondary outcomes since the greater the number of outcomes examined, the greater the chance that statistically predictable error will result in something appearing to be statistically significant even if it's not a true effect. Another form of p-hacking is to not define your sample size at the outset and instead collect data just until the results happen to dip below that magical p less than 0.05 cutoff, when if data collection was continued, the p-value might easily rise up higher again. One very common practice which spans the boundary between p-hacking and legitimate science is called post hoc analysis, in which a hypothesis is generated and tested after data has been collected. 
the scientifically valid approach to post hoc analysis would be to use such an after the fact hypothesis as the basis of a new experiment. After all, creating new hypotheses based on new observations is an essential step of the scientific method. Unfortunately, in practice, many clinicians take the post hoc analysis as a definitive answer to a clinical question, and many are never subjected to new experiments. And we have no idea how many hypotheses the researchers examined after the experiment was completed before finding one that fit the data for them to include in the paper. Regarding the need to uncover unexpected conclusions in order to be published in more prestigious journals, this incentivizes some researchers to preferentially explore novel or paradigm-shifting hypotheses, which are less likely to be true, even if the evidence appears to show otherwise. And media attention is a non-negligible factor. I could create an entire video series on the role of mass media in promoting bad science. It's incredible how bad newspapers and television networks are at reporting health news. On any given day, you can scroll through the health section of your favorite news website and find articles reporting on new studies. This obviously creates publicity for the authors and for their institutions and creates ad revenue for the media companies from user clicks. But almost all of the studies reported in mass media are garbage. They are small, p-hacked, and tested unbelievable out of the mainstream hypotheses. Any doctor with experience in evidence-based medicine can very quickly recognize these studies for the trashy clickbait that they are. Unfortunately, news companies, they don't have EBM experienced doctors on their payrolls, and journalists' knowledge of the methods and conclusions of the studies are often based just on press releases rather than the actual journal articles. Now, the most reputable scientists are not looking to have their research discussed in Oprah Magazine or on the doctors, but there's actually not a clear black and white distinction between those who are excited to see themselves quoted on MedPage Today and those who are excited to be interviewed on the Today Show. Media publicity of all forms influences how clinicians present data and even how they choose which clinical questions to ask. So far, these conflicts of interest have focused on the interests of academic researchers, but there are less savory conflicts of interest out there, namely the financial incentives of the pharmaceutical and medical device industries. Drug companies in particular may literally have billions of dollars riding on the outcome of a single study. That is a lot of incentive to be sure that your study shows a favorable outcome. How do they do this when the FDA does have oversight over any clinical trial that a company plans to use in their application for a drug's approval? First, a trial protocol may be ghostwritten by employees of a pharmaceutical company and not the published trial's official academically affiliated authors. That's not to say that the protocol isn't being accurately reported to the FDA or within the final paper, but the company will be more knowledgeable of the tricks of how to design protocols to maximize the probability of a positive result. Second, the pharmaceutical industry does the minimum necessary that's required for FDA approval and no more. If the FDA will be satisfied by a trial that tests a drug for a very specific indication in a carefully selected population with many exclusion criteria, why would a company ever fund a trial with broader indications in a population more representative of real life? Doing so would only decrease the chance of a positive result, and even if still positive, it would decrease the size of the measured effect, which of course hurts the bottom line. Third, drug and device companies are under no obligation to pursue publication of the trials they conduct. While the results of any trial registered with the FDA must be released to the FDA, as discussed earlier with the antidepressants paper, companies can strongly encourage their authors to not submit a negative trial to a medical journal. The FDA doesn't get fooled by this because they have all the information, but typical practicing doctors and the public certainly do get fooled. 
drug and device companies may also choose to delay the publication of either positive or negative results until a time that's most financially beneficial. I don't mean to unfairly demonize industry. After all, without industry, we would have many fewer innovations. These companies play a critical role in furthering medical science. However, profit is what they care about most, not a timely and responsible search for objective truth. So I've talked about how systematic bias, publication bias, statistically predictable error, and conflicts of interest all individually contribute to the phenomenon of most published medical research being wrong. But let's take a look at how they interact synergistically. To do this, I'll need to construct some two by two tables. We'll be looking at whether a hypothesis is true or false against whether a clinical trial testing that hypothesis was a so-called positive trial or negative one. Let's take a collection of 1,000 hypothetical, well-designed, randomized controlled trials, and initially just consider statistically predictable error. That's it to begin with. And let's say that these trials are testing hypotheses which are 20% likely to be correct. That may not sound that high, but it's a typical rough estimate used in the discussion of clinical research as a goal to shoot for. So of those 1,000 hypothetical trials, we have 200 trials whose hypothesis is true and 800 whose hypothesis is false. Of course, we have no way of knowing for sure, either before or after the trials are performed, which specific hypothesis falls into which category. Now let's look at the percentage of each of those sets of trials that will meet our preset thresholds for declaring the study to be positive or negative. By convention, the goal of trials is for them to be designed such that there is no more than a 20% chance that a beneficial therapy will not be recognized as such. In other words, this value here, the number of true hypotheses that have a negative trial, should be 20% of the total number of true hypotheses. So if 200 true hypotheses are subjected to a clinical trial, 160 of those trials will result in a true positive finding, while 40 of them will result in a false negative finding. Now let's look at the 800 false hypotheses. By setting a p-value of 0.05 as the threshold to declare a result to be statistically significant, we are saying that of the 800 false hypotheses, 5% of them will be false positives in this box, which is 40, and the remaining 760 are left here in the true negative box. If publication bias didn't exist, we could imagine that all 1,000 of those trials get published. This results in 920 true published research findings and 80 false published research findings. So if we ignore publication bias, systematic bias, and conflicts of interest, and only consider statistically predictable error, approximately 92% of published research findings would be true. That probably feels pretty reasonable. But now let's consider the effect of publication bias. Negative trials are much more difficult to publish. If every positive trial is published, but only 10% of the negative trials are, which may even be a generous estimate, then the published literature ends up with 160 true positive trials, 40 false positive trials, 4 false negative trials, and 76 true negative trials. This results in 84% of published trials being true. Publication bias worsens the accuracy of published trials because trials showing benefit are both more likely to be published and more likely to be wrong than trials showing no benefit. Let's add in systematic bias. Systematic bias can take many forms, but I'm going to just incorporate one of the most tangible, underpowering of a study. Remember that I said in an optimally designed trial, we want there to be no more than a 20% chance that a beneficial therapy is not recognized as being beneficial. In an underpowered study, this number is greater than 20%. This can happen either because the sample size is too small or because the size of the effect that investigators are trying to measure is too small. So what if this number is actually 50%? We can see how all the numbers shift. Now there are 100 true positives and 100 false negatives. Keeping the same degree of publication bias, 
the overall rate of true published research findings drops to 78%. And finally, we have conflicts of interest. How might conflicts of interest play a role? Well, for one, researchers get more media interest and a higher probability of publication into a high-impact journal, the more paradigm-shifting a positive trial appears to be. So they test particularly unlikely hypotheses. This means that the expected chance that the hypothesis is true before the trial drops lower than 20%. So what if it's 5% instead, with the same p-value cutoff of 0.05 and the same degree of underpowering? That gives us 25 true positive findings, 25 false negative findings, 48 false positive findings, and 902 true negative findings. If we have the same degree of publication bias, we now have an overall rate of true published findings of 69%. 69% is pretty low, but of course it's not less than 50, which was my initial claim at the very beginning of the video and which empiric evidence seems to support. However, there are a few more things to consider. First, while this brief analysis considered underpowering of the trial, it did not account for other forms of systematic bias, such as imperfect randomization, lack of a true control, unexplained differences in the dropout rate between the intervention and control groups, whether an objective endpoint was used, and how good the blinding of patients and investigators was. The analysis didn't account for p-hacking, or trial authors who test 20 hypotheses in post hoc analysis, but only report the one that was statistically significant. It doesn't account for deliberate fraud. And most importantly, it was assuming the hypothetical studies we were considering were randomized controlled trials, which in general, are the most methodologically sound of medical studies, but which comprise only a small part of the medical literature. If all these other factors could be accounted for, and there are scientists whose field of study is trying to do just that, then that 69% would almost certainly dip below 50. For any viewers interested in a more mathematically rigorous discussion of these effects, I highly recommend the seminal paper why Most Published Findings Are False by John Ioannidis, who also authored several other of the aforementioned studies. A free open access link to this paper is in the video description. Now, let's talk solutions. How can we improve the quality and reliability of published medical research and of medical science more generally? There should be more public funding of research compared to private funding. This isn't to say that private companies can't pay for their own studies. Of course they should be able to do so. But to help reduce conflicts of interest, the balance should tip the other direction. Academic institutions should stop valuing the volume of publications during deliberations about an individual's academic promotion and should solely focus on the quality of their scientific contributions. Journals should be further encouraged to publish negative trials and replication studies. In fact, there exists a journal dedicated to the publication of negative results, descriptively called the Journal of Negative Results in Biomedicine. Its goal is providing scientists and physicians with responsible and balanced information to support informed experimental and clinical decisions. We need more of that mentality. Journals should require open access to the complete methods and all data at the time of a paper's publication. This will allow the public to double check the work of the authors, to monitor for data dredging, and to make it easier for other researchers to attempt replication studies. I didn't even discuss in this video the observation that a surprisingly high number of published papers contain simple math errors missed by our poor peer review process. These are hard to catch if the full data is not made available to the public. Results from all publicly funded clinical trials should be easily available, irrespective of whether the trial ever gets published. Widespread established practices, which have not been rigorously tested in a large randomized controlled trial, should be. Remember back to when I discussed the phenomenon of medical reversal? When established practices are rigorously tested by 
better methodology than they were originally, less than half of these practices were confirmed to be beneficial. The media. The media needs to be incentivized to conduct better health reporting. No more reporting on tiny hypothesis generating studies and no more focus on those studies which inspire sensationalistic headlines but are without substance. And the news media needs actual doctors on their payroll to fact check the press releases which currently serve as a major source of their information. Finally, and most relevant to my work as a medical educator, we need better instruction in med school and residency as to how to appraise the medical literature. We sort of teach evidence-based medicine to trainees currently, but I can't help but think medical educators have done them a disservice by doing an incomplete job. Too many junior doctors are left with the belief that practicing evidence-based medicine is about quoting the latest studies and remembering catchy trial acronyms. Compared to prior generations of doctors, we've gone from trusting our gut over the evidence to trusting the evidence without critically appraising it. And I don't think that's an improvement. Those of us in medical education need to take this problem seriously. Appraising clinical papers and research methods should not be topics squeezed into the curriculum in random places wherever there's room. Instead, this needs to be fully integrated into everything that we teach. Understanding how we know something is just as important as understanding what it is we think we know. Will these solutions eliminate false conclusions in the literature and the misapplication of research in clinical practice? No. There will always be a non-negligible rate of false findings in the published medical literature. But these ideas will make the number of false findings as low as possible, will help doctors better apply the medical literature, and ultimately help to improve the faith our patients have in medical science. I hope you enjoyed this discussion as to why most published research findings are false. If so, please remember to like and share the video and consider becoming a subscriber if you aren't already. I've listed a bunch of relevant papers and other resources in the video description for those of you who want to learn more about this important and fascinating topic. Although this video is not sponsored, I still want to specifically recommend a wonderful book called Ending Medical Reversal by Vinay Prasad and Adam Sifu. It discusses many of the same issues that are raised in this video. It, along with the aforementioned papers by John Ioannidis, were the major inspirations for me tackling this topic to begin with. And I owe those guys some thanks, I think, for making me more skeptical of what it is I do every day.